Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another Friday community message. I hope you guys are doing well and everyone's staying safe. Um, Jumma Mubarak to you all. Um, as we have our weekly programs, we've brought in a very special guest here with us, who is the former president of the Shura Council and also the current president of Uplift Charity. We've got with us brother Owais Data Boy. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum, Wali. Assalamu alaikum to everybody out there. Great to be on with you again. Absolutely. And thank you very much for giving us your time. Um, and I know you've, you've done uh, multiple programs with us and we're highly appreciative of, of your time. Anytime. It's always my pleasure, actually, especially talking about something that is so close to my heart, about this philanthropic um, endeavor that we started so many years ago called Uplift. Now, before we get started, um, what does one mean when saying, does charity really start at home? Yeah, so we have to, you know, I mean, I think this is in any community, but especially the Muslim community, um, we're taught and we're told, you know, back through our history that we have to work inward and then go outward. So we're supposed to start with our family and our friends um, who may need our financial or uh, emotional support, whatever kind of support they need. We're supposed to start with them. Then we go to the local community, which is a little bit outward because we know we can't have uh, our neighbors go hungry, people of any faith, right? Um, while we're filling our bellies. I mean, that's against what we're taught. Um, once we strengthen our local area, then we can think about going outward with our relief. Imagine um, our local area being, you know, devoid of widespread need how much more we could do for the people outside of our local communities, right? So if we have stronger people, like if we can make everyone in our community stronger, then those people that are stronger and the people that already are strong financially and you know, health-wise and everything else, we can help more people outwardly as well. So it's one of those things that we're supposed to do uh, you know, through our religious uh, background. Um, you know, Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him, when he sent Muad bin Jabal to uh, Yemen, he told him after you convey the message and the people start to pray and they start to do the right thing, take the, the zakat or the money from their rich and give it to their poor. And what was not taught there was send the money back to Arabia, you know, to where we are, to Medina, and we'll give it out to the good people here. No, he said, take it from there and give it there. And even today in modern day uh, life in the world, in just about any country that has difficulties, there are people that can also give and support the people there. It's just the infrastructure is not built that way, but it needs to be. So we often find ourselves here in America supporting the rest of the world. And we should do that, you know, especially in those areas that, um, um, you know, like the government has uh, kind of fallen apart or the structures are not there and people are not able to get assistance or there's famine and it's just, there's no way to get through unless people from the outside come to help. We're all in favor for that as well, but we must start with our own locality. And thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and again, I think that's pers personally, uh, myself as well, I've noticed that trend uh, as you suggested, you know, it, it, everything starts at home, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like when, when you're trying to um, do something for the family, you're making sure that the family is taken care of before you go and, you know, assist others in the community or Absolutely. other families as well. Um, same analogy that I'm listening and I'm hearing from you is that let's start with our own community first and then little by little to start spread and, and, and share more resources and information and, and even finances. Well, because the, the reverse is, is really problematic, right? Where you're taking care of people very far away from you. Let, let's, let's not even say the rest of the, the world, but just... You know, if you're in Southern California and you're helping people and, and spending all your money in Wisconsin, that doesn't really make sense, right? There's good people that are going to help there. So imagine not taking care of your local community. Imagine um, somebody that you respect, a prophet, someone else coming to America at this time in our locality and saying, why aren't you doing these things for the people right around you, right? That it's totally unacceptable. So yeah. it's, it's just uh, makes logical sense. To start with your local community and then move outward from there. Absolutely, it does make logical sense. But would you say is is there a sense of um, kind of um, what what is the sense of like like for instance an individual that sends money to let's say Wisconsin, 
Wisconsin mm-hmm. before doing it here. Like, right. what's the rationale behind that? Uh, do we well, know so that? I, I use Wisconsin, so I wouldn't use another part of the world, right? I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're, we're often eager to send money because, uh, to places where we feel like we're being prompted because of an emergency. And like I said, we, we should be doing that but not at the risk of not supporting people locally. See, what ends up happening is people locally here, they even, when, I, when I'm talking to them about Upload, they'll say, well, is there, are there really people that have need over here? Um, I can give you the cases and I'll talk later about it, about how it was so horrible, you know, before we got started that we decided to actually start the organization. So there are people here, you just don't see them. Um, there are people, you know, they fall into really hard times and they have difficulty or people that are about to fall off the cliff, but we're able to support them before they get to that situation. Um, now coming, you know, to, to the main, uh, root of what has been established, you know, by yourself, um, yeah. uh, now tell us a little bit about Uplift Charity. When was it established and what's it, what, what is its mission and vision? Okay. So it was started in the summer of 2006. Um, I had this idea, and I think others had the idea as well. I mean, I actually went to my cousin, who was pretty active in the local community as well. His name is Fuad. So I went to him, and, you know, finally we had a meeting. And everything that I was telling him, he said, you know what? I have the same inspiration. I have the same thoughts as you. So it was kind of like, it just was like magic coming together. So then we, we got my brother involved, who had some local government experience, and uh, one of my very good friends named Yakub. So my brother's Omar. Yakub is uh, one of my friends who has uh, accounting background. So we just thought these would be some good people to get started. And we didn't have a name. We didn't have anything. We just had a concept. We all got together, all four of us, and we started it back in 2006. And we started off at a good pace, and we started to find out about the local refugees, and uh, we started to assist them. And so it, it became pretty uh, fast, pretty quick. Um, the amount of support that was needed out there. But our, um, our mission is to assist and empower the local community one family at a time. And what that really means to assist and empower one family at a time um, is that you, you're not just going to do like a, you know, a, shot, uh, a shotgun approach where you're just helping everyone at the same time without giving proper attention to each family. So our whole idea is to have people get to self-sufficiency because they don't want a handout. They really don't. Just like you and I don't want a handout, right? We would much rather provide for ourselves. They're the same way. So one of the conditions of assistance is that you have to be on this journey with us. We're not going to do all the work because we can't drag you up. We need to help pull you up, right? That's the idea. And then um, our, our vision is to serve as the trusted Zakat administrator Um, by directly assisting the most vulnerable and impoverished amongst us uh, in a compassionate manner that promotes self-sufficiency. And self-sufficiency is one one of those keywords for us because if we don't have that, we'd be giving out a million dollars a month um, if we're just writing checks. And we're not the government. We can't do that. But one thing, Willie, before I, I stop here is one of the unique, very unique things about Uplift is that if you give us a dollar in zakat, the full dollar goes to assist people. We don't use a single penny for anything except for the assistance of people. So that dollar will go to pay for somebody's rent or utilities or food. It will not a single penny will be used for marketing or for uh, anything else. And we, we just set it up that way from the beginning, you know, from uh, people that we talked to, they said, why don't you, if you're really interested in doing it the right way, why don't you do this? Show us that you're committed. And so we, we've been, you know, fortunate to be able to get the support of people um, to help us along the way. Wonderful. And, and thank you for sharing that as well. So for, for our viewers that are watching the program, they understand that, you know, the money that is being given to Uplift Charity goes 100% to the needy families. That's right. The zakat. That's correct. And, and thank you for, uh, you know, sharing your experiences and kind of your thoughts on how, you know, you, uh, your brother, uh, it was uh, your, your friend, your brother, and I believe you said your cousin that came together and, and uh, created Uplift Charity, established That's it. Right. Now, I'm going to take a step forward even before sharing this information with them. What really drove you or what was kind of the, the point of time that, or the mindset that you had? Or did you go through an experience with a certain family um, knowing that, you know what, we need to establish something in the community? So what was kind of the driving force behind your mindset? 
so I, I've been asked that a few different times. And I, it, I always go back to the fact that my mother, when we used to travel when, when I was young, um, we'd go back, you know, to where she was born in Pakistan. And she would make it a point, even when I was eight, nine, 10 years old, uh, to say, hey, we're going to go out to this area against her mother's wishes, because her mother said, hey, why are you going to that area? Don't go there. Um, she would take me and she'd say, she would tell me at that time, and I still remember, I'm, I'm showing you this because you need to know how other people are dealing with life. And they're still happy. And in most cases, they're still happy. But look, look at the poverty that you'll find. And so wherever you find this poverty, you should try to, you know, help people. And then um, it was, you know, after, for a lot of people after 9-11, you start to think, right? Like, what, what am I, like, what's really going on here? Like, what, what should I be doing? Should I be um, just all about myself? Should I be doing something else? So there was this, you know, invigoration into a lot of people to try to help other people um, because you're trying to find yourself right through that and you're trying to earn good deeds. So I, I think it was a combination of a lot of different things. And then as I was um, starting to think about this, it, every night, like it, I would just start to get really uneasy. Like I need to do this. I need to do this. Like it just kept coming to me and it kept hitting me. So I was like, this never happens with anything else. I better go do something about this. And so I looked at the local community instead of looking um, internationally. And I learned about, you know, helping locally first. And I found that Masajid and, you know, other religious institutions were having a lot of difficulty helping people because if somebody comes in and says, I need $500 worth of rent and, and they have this money at that religious institution to help people. They, don't, they, they can't actually verify the person needs it. So they feel very uncomfortable. So what we found is that people from San Diego would travel all the way through San Diego, Orange County and LA looking to make up all of the money. They'd have to go to 10 different institutions that would give them $50 at a time. Uh, very inefficient. And in some cases it caused disastrous, disastrous um, uh, ramifications. You know, I'll, I'll give you two real quickly. One was in Los Angeles, we were told about this lady, um, somebody that knew her contacted me and said, look, we have this lady, we haven't heard from her in a couple of years. She used to come over all the time. Uh, she was, her, her husband left her. And so I don't know what happened, but can you look into it and I'll try to find you contact information. So we found out um, she had two girls, both of them were going to college at a, at a nice, a great school, a UC school. And um, because the, the husband left, um, there were, the income was not there. So the mother was going to local mosque uh, and other organizations and asking for rent shortfall to, you know, to take care of that. And either they couldn't, they didn't have the money or they didn't uh, believe her and she didn't keep pressing it because she had her own dignity. So she ended up being on the street to the point where both her daughters, because they couldn't take showers and whatnot, they were living behind a bush somewhere. Um, they ended up dropping out of the UC and developing uh, mental, uh, you know, issues, as did the mother. So it was it was such a difficult situation. And even when we got them into a place, their mental uh, issues did cause them, you know, to to make a mess in the in the apartment where, you know, where even the landlord had difficulty with them. So, um, you know, it can get to that point if we're not doing it the right way, we can cause unlimited uh, harm to people just because we didn't know how to take care of somebody. So I'll, I'll just stop with that one example. No, th and thank you for sharing that. It's actually a very powerful and uh, an amazing example that you give. Uh, that, that's something pretty common, right? And, and pretty normal uh, and natural. What happens is that uh, when someone does have financial difficulties, they'll start thinking of, well, how do, we, how do I make finances? How do I make sure that I'm paying rent? And that causes a lot of stressors and causes mental health challenges. You start to stop eating. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a snowball effect, uh, but, but a, a, an amazing example that you give for that. Um, and thank you for doing that. So now let's get to the programming part of Uplift Charity. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the um, programmings or current programs that Uplift Charity provides? Yeah. So the, the basic thing, the, the first thing that we should go to here, which is not an exciting thing to talk about, kind of, you know, like if you talk about uh, our auto program, our car donation program, that's kind of exciting, right? Where people are giving us a car and then we're giving it to people. And we've done this almost 200 times now because in Southern California, you need to be able to get around. Otherwise you're late to work and you get fired, right? Yeah. Um, but the first thing that we do, the most important thing, this is like six days a week, if not seven, is case management. And this is, you know, taking on the family that comes in, 
getting their agreement that they're going to, to work on themselves and then doing everything you can, putting everything into them to get them to self-sufficiency. So that's the major part of Uplift. That's 90% of what we do. And then we, we do have programs. We have a refugee tutoring program we've been um, you know, working on for years now where we wanted to give those uh, youngsters that came in from other countries who have difficulty learning, we wanted to give them a tutor to be able to assist them. As I mentioned, we have a card donation program and uh, you know, this really helps people to become self-sufficient as well. And it just takes somebody's third or fourth vehicle that's in running order, they get a tax break for giving it to us. And then, you know, we polish it up and give it to the family and, and they are ecstatic and able to actually become even more self-sufficient. We have a furniture donation program to help, especially when there's a lot of refugees coming in, which there's a lull in that right now, but it's, it's supposed to ramp up. But so we put a, a, a break on that for a little bit. We also visit detention centers because when people come in as asylum seekers, oftentimes they're put into detention centers and they're not able to communicate with anyone. So now think about mental anguish at that point, right? You don't have anyone that cares for you. So um, one of our, our operations director does this on a regular basis, like three or four times a month, we'll go out and visit them just to give them hope. And hey, when you come out, you know, you come to Uplift and we'll take care of you. And then one of the uh, exciting things that we do, you know, we've been doing for over 10 years, we started in 06, but we, I think we've done it since 06, is uh, we learned this from another small organization, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, some local ladies that were helping people, they would put together, um, you know, packages of food, maybe 30 at a time during Ramadan, something like that. We thought it was a great idea. So we made it into a big program. And at the height of it, we were giving out um, 3,000 boxes of food during uh, Ramadan. Wow. And now, uh, like if you look at 3,000 uh, boxes of food, I'm just doing a quick calculation here because I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but it's about, I'll tell you, it's about 60 tons of food just in Ramadan. And now that's actually gone international. You'll actually see, we, we use the term Ramadan food box. And so now national and international organizations are doing the same thing, not only during Ramadan, but other times calling it, you know, food box, right? Yeah. And then some say food bag. And we're glad that they're doing that because food is one of those critical things. And when you give a gift of a box of food, you know, it, it shows the person that's receiving it not only helps them with nutrition, if you're giving them good food, but it also gives them hope that your local community cares enough to give me a gift of food. I'm not even having to go search for them. They're trying to come to me. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention, because I think I've already taken a lot of time. Well, during Ramadan, we also, you know, take fidya and kafara money for people that can't fast and they want to make up for it through giving food to others. And so we have a nightly iftar program. And the final thing we do is a, a food pantry distribution. Um, and, you know, we were giving to about 190 families before, and that's gone up to about 400 families a month now. So you're impacting, you know, 12, 1300 people. Yeah. And we're looking to expand that program as well. Well, amazing programs. A lot of programs, which I wasn't even aware of, you know, it's kind of the services that um, you guys were providing. Um, now, what is the plan or how has Uplift Charity, let's say, before we get to what, how has Uplift Charity been able to serve the <clears throat> the clients admit, admits the pandemic. I wanted to hear what are some of its goals for the community here in Southern California? Yeah, so when, when we first started, our goal was um, to help anyone we found that we could help, right? And so what we found at the time is that we had, um, we found people that were living in their cars, Muslims even, right? Muslims living in their cars. Let's just talk about the Muslim population, living in their cars, living on the street, living in motels for the long term. Like imagine the smallest room in your house and you have five people living in there with a tiny fridge, which you can't even put in a gallon of milk into. <clears throat> so, you know, helping those people um, and not having any more of those situations because we would have a lot of those situations at one time and then we'd get them in motels and we were basically filling up one of the uh, motels on Lincoln Avenue with people that we found that were having the situation where they're living in their car or on the street. And so that went on for years, and then we got better at self-sufficiency programs. But now what we find is that if you find, if Wali or any mosque uh, employee or leader finds a homeless Muslim in their community, or even somebody else that's not Muslim but, you know, is not out there just because of uh, drugs or whatnot, right? Because there is that element as well that happens. 
they rush to contact us and say, we can't believe it. There's somebody living on the street or they're in their car. Like it's become so different now where before it was kind of commonplace because we cleaned up that situation. We're, we're so glad to have been able to do that. And we're glad that no one looks at it as uh, an unimportant thing anymore. So what we want is we honestly, we want not a single person in our local area to go hungry because we have, uh, and I'm talking about not just uplift now, I'm talking about, you said goals for the community. Um, we have so many entities now that are uh, running food programs that if, if you're asked for food, you're gonna get it, right? We just need to know that you need it. So if somebody's listening and they need food, you just need to let us know uh, or our network of different organizations run by Muslims here, let us know. And we, we need to work better together, remove some unhealthy competition that may be out there to raise funds and you know just keep marketing yourself instead of doing the work, right? If you do the work, the support will come in so many different ways. You, you'll, be, you'll be inundated with support if you just do the work because people will see that you're doing it on their behalf. Um, if you're doing it for them, they don't have to do it as much, right? And um, another goal is to strengthen and lift up as many families as we can so they can be healthy, safe, and productive, and then they can help the next person. Th those are our real main goals. Awesome, and thank you for sharing that. Now, how can Uplift Charity, or how has Uplift Charity been able to serve its clients amidst this pandemic? Well, has, has there been kind of a restructure of, of how you guys do your work now? Yeah, so, you know, I, I was, I was telling other uh, groups of people as well, that we talk about this sometimes, that, if the institution is not there to begin with, you can't help a person, right? You, what you're gonna do is going to be, um, it's an effort that is not coordinated. It doesn't have enough support, doesn't have enough funding. You might be able to work it, work it for a little bit, but it's not sustainable. So the good thing is there's so many entities, including Uplift Charity that have been there before the pandemic. And we actually, we, we keep anticipating that there's going to be something that happens in the economy or some unforeseen issue that's gonna come up. So we keep enough funds, you know, to make sure that we'll have that uh, ability to help people. So not a single person that came to us with real need was turned away for financial reasons, right? We helped each person. Um, what we typically do, which is very different than other organizations, we visit every family where they live. So if someone calls us from their car and that's where they're living, we visit them. If someone calls us from a motel, we visit them. If they call us from an apartment, we visit them because we want to break down the barriers. If someone is coming to us and sitting across from a, a, a desk from us, you know, they have to try to prove to us that, um, that they need assistance, right? That's what's in their mind. Where we're looking to just find out, just tell us everything about you so we can help you more than what you asked for, right? Because it, you might just be asking for food, but there's an issue why you're asking for food. So we want to help that so you don't have to ask for food anymore because you don't want to ask for food, right? And so, um, you know, that's that's kind of the way we, we look at this. And um, so now instead of visiting every family every single time, we do a lot of it through phone calls instead. Um, but we still, you know, try to reach them where they're at. It may not be inside their home any, anymore, it might be outside, but it does break down those barriers. Yeah, awesome. And I like, I like how the, the fact how you guys are actually going to their homes or you're trying to meet them where they're at. Because usually if I'm coming in, let's say, for example, if I'm coming in for financial assistance and then when you do come and assess me or see the current situation of my family, well, kids need, you know, they don't have clothing, you know, they, they, they don't have, uh, we don't have a car, yeah. there's not enough food. So, so that, that's, that, that's amazing because what I'm seeing is that what I'm hearing is that you guys are able to assess you know, further beyond what they're asking for. Right. So not only does it break down the barriers, but let me give you a quick other story that happened early on when we first started in 2006. A local refugee resettlement agency we were talking to said, okay, you guys want to help people? Let me send some people, re recent refugees. So this gentleman, he's probably 60, but he seemed like he was much older. He came from another country. So just was like that. And his wife, and he had like a 15 or 18 year old daughter. So, um, you know, we said, okay, we'll come visit you. He hardly spoke any English. I actually did the visit myself and um, went there and I said, hey, you know, built some rapport with him, said that we want to assist him. And, he's, and he didn't have a job. He, he was going to run out of enough money to pay for rent as well. And so I, I wanted to assess and see like what else is going on here. So I said, just tell me anything else that is going on in the house. So he walked me over to the bedroom 
and I saw the mattress was like about this thin. And, and I asked him, where'd you get it from? He said, I, you know, from the dumpster because people throw things out over there. So they brought that in. Right. And, and so then he showed me, his, I said, do you have enough food? So he showed me all the cabinets and there were some dishes, a few dishes that were given to them. No food in the cabinets, not a single thing in the cabinets. So, so I said, okay, well, must be in the fridge. He opened up the fridge and I mean, it's etched in my brain, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of this just keeps us trying to do more because we see that there's going to be people so humble. They're not going to come to us yeah. unless we find them. And so um, guess what he had? He had two items in the fridge. He had two items in the fridge that day. He had uh, a half gallon of milk, or actually it was a gallon of milk with half the bottle remaining and a sack of potatoes in the fridge. Okay, we usually don't keep potatoes in the fridge. He may be, sure. didn't know about that. Those were the two things. So, you know, they needed a little bit of rental assistance, but guess what we did? We filled up their house with donated furniture, including new mattresses and beds. They were sleeping on the ground, right? And that, that's not a problem, except that the mattress was decrepit. Uh, we filled up their food, uh, their, their kitchen. We gave them new dishes. We did everything we could, and this was, you know, donated items that we could easily give to them because there's so much wealth uh, in our community that, and, it, and it's so rewarding for people to be able to help. So that's just one example. I could give you a dozen. And it's, um, thank you for sharing that. It's a very powerful, <clears throat> it's a very powerful example that you just shared. And, <clears throat> and not just that, but I think through these stories and through your actual um, experience, you know, hopefully we as a community can do more. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think my, I'm losing my voice this morning. No um, I, I think, yeah, uh, we as a community can do more. Um, and, um, and, and, it, and it's amazing that the fact that you're going out there yourself personally and, and you know, and, and seeing and working with these families to make sure that they're being safe and they're taken care of as well. Um, now, coming to my next question is, have you noticed anything in particular during the pandemic? Uh, which, like, for instance, which services are being, uh, let's say, utilized the most in the current moment? So we have, I mean, March of last year was a huge spike up in uh, financial assistance needed. And we were seeing that people were not paying their utilities or, you know, partial payments to rent. So things were starting to add up. So we did see that. That was one thing. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the other thing that is so clear to show people is a doubling up of the need for food. And so we, we distribute out of uh, Ansar Masjid in Anaheim. And we've been doing that for years because they asked us to come in and do the program years ago. And, you know, there none of the community members from from anaheim that were just regular community members right outside of our religious faith none of them were coming in not a single one until the pandemic hit and then when the pandemic hit those same people were kind of you know upset that so many cars were in their areas on saturdays now they were coming in to get food as well so we've seen a huge uptick so from about 190 on average to almost sometimes over 400 families um, at a given time. So that, that's, that's been a huge increase. Gotcha. And now how, how can the community be more involved with Uplift Charities programs or, or learn more about it? Yeah, I think, you know, any, um, any nonprofit really wants you to get to know what they do, because once you do, you might fall in love with them, <laughs> you know? So like, just like at Shura Council, I don't think enough people have gone deep enough to understand what the Shura Council does and the various programs that it has uh, but once you do, you'll fall in love with it. You know, there's naysayers out there that say you don't, you're not doing enough because they don't understand it, actually, right? It's, it's doing so much work. It's doing the work of 10 people with three or four. Um, and the same thing with Uplift. Like, if you actually learn about the intentions and sincerity and the work that gets done without causing fanfare, right? We might put something on Facebook for you to see. But we're not sending you uh, uh, letters every month and asking for more and more donate. We, where we put our attention is, is on doing the work. And then, you know, the, the blessings come from above. So we're happy about that. But, um, you know, people can follow us on Facebook at Uplift Charity. That's probably the place that we'll uh, put out the most information. Go to upliftcharity.org. We put out um, a newsletter every month or maybe sometimes more often than that. So if people sign up for our newsletter, they'll get to see what we're doing and we provide the numbers as well, how many people we've assisted, how many dollars we've spent. Um, we do all of that. What we would really want, because I mentioned earlier that 100% of Sakat money goes towards people, is we don't take a cut from that to 
employ people or market or whatnot. So what we would ask people to do is sign up for our monthly giving program, right? Just go on there, sign up for general funds or Celica because that's much more flexible. And, and some of that money we use towards people of other faiths um, for food and also to run the organization. So if, if you become a monthly sustainer, that, that's so powerful, right? Any organization that you can help on a regular basis, it gives them a much better uh, understanding of, you know, they, they can hire more people because they know that money's going to keep coming in and they can do more work. And that's the same thing with, uh, with Uplift. Awesome. And again, thank you so much for, for giving us your time and for sharing uh, this wonderful information um, for, in educating, especially personally myself. I learned so much uh, today more about Uplift um, than I knew, you know, by doing research or by just even working alongside Uplift Charity in the past. Um, and you guys are, and you guys are growing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so that's, that's something new that, you know, um, that I've, that I've, that I've heard this far. Um, now, lastly, before we finish uh, for today, any last suggestions or takeaway for, for our viewers? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'll go back to what we started with, but a little bit more, I'd say give locally, find ways to help and get involved, right? Um, you're going to feel so much better about yourself when you're doing something for other people. And you'll find this that often when, when people make it in the world, what we consider making it, right, they, they still feel empty. And so they, they search for what is going to make them happy. And ultimately, they say, I need to help other people. But as people of faith, if anyone's listening who's, who's of any kind of faith and you have understanding of your own uh, religious doctrine, is that you know, even beforehand, you don't need someone to tell you that if you help someone else is going to help you. And it helps you in many different ways. Your community is going to become stronger. You feel better about it. You get a rush of adrenaline and other good things that happen to you, right? That you help somebody. And so I, I would say start with that. Earn all the good deeds as you can because that's what you got to do. Make a difference in the lives of, you know, people that are coming to you on the street and you don't believe them. Give them something. What, what is it going to harm you? And your sincerity level is not about them trying to rip you off, right? Because you hear that from people like, well, this person is just getting a lot of it. So if you assess that, yes, this person is, you know, an issue, okay, maybe don't assist them. But if you don't know, it's really about yourself. It's not only about them. You know, you're helping yourself through this. And um, I would say, don't just help uplift, help anything that deserves your attention and our attention. Um for example, Wally, you know, somebody might be an animal lover or a nature enthusiast. Well, you can find organizations where you can feed animals that don't have food, right? And, and bring them back to good health. You can help with uh, sustaining the environment, you know, beach cleanups and things like that. Sure. And then from that, you're going you're gonna to build your, your uh, giving muscles, your charitable muscles. Just like you have to, you know, my son is, you know, doing pretty well, thankfully now in math. But he had to get up to that by, by building that ability. And then, you know, some people in our community are great enthusiasts in working out, right, and building muscles. You have to do the same thing with charity. When the opportunity, when someone says, hey, give us something for this and it's a legitimate cause, do it, right? If you can't give $1,000, give $50, but you're going to build up that, uh, that muscle. So as you do it more, you'll, you'll find uh, more happiness in doing it as well. And um, I, the, the final thing I'll say is just commit to being uh, a person who wants to remove hardships from people, right? Remove obstacles from people. And what we're told in our specific religious uh, background is that if you remove an obstacle from somebody here on earth, that will be done for you in the hereafter, right? And, and those obstacles are gonna be much more difficult to, uh, to, to take care of. And finally, we're not a religious organization. We're actually a public charity. So we're not just helping Muslims. It just happens to be that uh, Muslims give us their zakat money, which is restricted funds, just like any other organization has restricted funds. But we do try to help uh, people of all faiths, um, especially if people support us for that. And I, I thank you, Willie, for allowing me to talk about something I'm so, so passionate about. It, it beautifully said. And again, it is our honor to have you in, in, in our platform and and, and just even beyond that is that you serving our community um, because you understand the need, you understand the situation that's that has taken place here in the community and, and you're there, you're in the forefront of serving the community. Um, so for that, thank you very much. And thank you for giving us your time.
My pleasure. Thanks um, so much. I said again, uh, dear brothers and sisters, for those that are watching uh, the program, uh, you know, in order to provide charity, you know, like Brother Way suggested, sometimes it doesn't have to be finances. It can be you going out of your way and giving your time to, you know, to, to, to a good cause. Um, it doesn't have to be specifically for one charity, but it can be to any charity or multiple charities, as long as you know that the, you're serving the need or you're helping the community um, fulfill that need as well. And now, lastly, before we conclude, I would like to remind everyone that uh, Salam Shore Council of Southern California is having their 26th annual banquet on April 3rd. It's Saturday. Uh, please save the date and stay tuned as the program will be at 7.30 p.m. Our we're not, speakers... We're not going to want to miss that one. We, we really do not want, want to miss that one. Um, your, your support is needed. We would like you to follow and, and watch our program so you guys are updated with, you know, what's taking place in, here in Southern California and what the Islamic Shore Council of Southern California is doing um, for the community. Our guest speakers thus far are Sheikh Soheb Webb and also Sheikh Muslim of Purmo. Other than that, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day and Jummah Mubarak to you all. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum.